we might have a lot of questions um, tonight. So <clears throat> I just want to welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight for the um, Black Wealth Community Education Series. Uh, we're really excited. We have some really, really great panelists that I'm personally excited about. Um, and we really have a good session um, for you tonight. <clears throat> So this is our fourth session. Oh, let me introduce myself. My name is Lavasha. I'm the program manager with the Open Road Fund here at Nexus. Um, and I'm one of five staff who oversees the program. Um, this is our fourth session within our Black Wealth Community Education Series. And they're all um, tailored around our Black five Black Wealth Building themes. Um, tonight's session is about economic power and ownership. And our other themes include financial well-being, housing and shelter, education, health and healing. And for tonight's workshop, it will be recorded and it will also be sent out to you guys after um, the training is complete within a couple of days. So if you guys wanna go back and um, watch it again, if you wanna share it with your family and friends or community, feel free to do so. All of our sessions are also free um, and live here tonight and we'll have some time for you guys to ask questions at the end. Next slide. So just want to give you guys a little bit of overview and background about Nexus Community Partners, if you're not familiar with Nexus. Nexus is a nonprofit that is um, in St. Paul, Minnesota, and the mission is to build more engaged and powerful communities of color by supporting community building initiatives that expand community wealth and foster social and human capital. Um, the Open Road Fund is a program that is stewarded by Nexus Community Partners, and it was funded by the Bush Foundation. Our program goal is to, our program um, grants $50,000 grants to black individuals um, of the African descent whose ancestors were enslaved as a result of the mid-Atlantic slave trade. The effort is to serve as a catalyst for black wealth, but we're not a reparations program. If you guys wanna know more about us as well, we can pop that um, link to the website in the chat as well. Um, the fund currently serves Minnesota, North Dakota and South Dakota residents. Um, who identify as African descendants of slaves. In our, yeah. All righty, so we partner with several um, community partners um, in the community to do this work. We don't do this work alone. We do have five team members, but we also have an advisory committee. Some of these faces may be familiar to you, some may not be. Um, this is, again, uh, you can go to our website to learn more about our advisory committee. And they are from all over the region. So we have some folks in Minnesota, some in North Dakota, and some in South Dakota. Next slide. We also have a research um, partner, um, evaluation partner that we work with as well, who've been doing um, some evaluation work with and that helped us shape our um, Black wealth definition as well as the Black wealth building themes. Um, and this is, uh, which is research in action um, based out of Minneapolis. <clears throat> and so tonight we're going to focus on economic power and ownership, again, which is one of the five um, themes or pillars of our program. Um, if you're familiar or, you know, we're aware of the fund last year, we did a community survey and asked folks, what did they think Black wealth was? Uh, one, we didn't want to define it for folks. We know that people define it in many different ways, right? And we also know that it's not just money. There are different... Um, definitions of black wealth. And out of that big definition came um, a theme. So we've seen that economic ownership and power was a recurring thing among black folks in the region. Um, and this is kind of how they defined economic power and ownership. So I will give you guys just a few minutes to read that over a couple of seconds to get grounded in that. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So for our agenda tonight, we, we did our overview. We will do our um, workshop, our introductions. Um, we'll do some panelist introductions. So we'll do our workshop first. Um, we'll watch a video to give you guys a visual to kind of get you guys grounded in that um, black wealth definition to kind of talk about what is economic ownership? What does it look like? What does it not look like? Um, and then we'll have some guest panelists here tonight that will talk about it a little bit more. And then again, we'll open it up for some panelist discussion. So if you all have questions, feel free to put it in the um, Q&A section. 
that's recommended. But if you want to put them in the chat because you can't navigate it, that's fine as well. We'll navigate it on the back. And then we'll have some resources that we'll share with you at the end. We'll welcome you to share some resources if you want to in the chat amongst each other. Um, and then we'll talk about some next steps after today. And then we'll do a survey or we'll send you a survey link in the chat as well as email so that you guys can give us feedback about tonight's session um, and what you want to see moving forward. And then we'll wrap it up. All righty, so I'm not going to be moderating tonight, <laughs> um, but I am going to pass it over to Danielle, who is our Senior Director of Community Wealth Building here at Nexus. Um, she oversees the Open Road Farm Program, but she also helps to found the North Star Black Cooperative Fellowship Program. So I'll pass it over to Danielle. Thank you, Lavasha. Um, I am really, really so happy to be here with all of you tonight. I know that there's probably a hundred other things that you all could be doing. And so we don't take it lightly that you chose to spend your time with us tonight at the Black Wealth Community Education Session. Um, we have, like Lavasha said, we have a really great session planned for, for all of us tonight. Um, we all get to learn from such brilliant and powerful people <clears throat> that are doing such transformative and impactful work for Black community wealth and economic ownership. The panelists that you'll get to spend your, your evening with represent the rich legacy of Black economic community work that has so often either been stolen or removed or hidden away from us. <clears throat> the panelists' work we will learn about and their efforts is, I believe, each of our inheritance. It's something that we have done forever and that um, we are just truly grateful for each panelist's commitment to the work and all that they have bring to, brought to it in their unique ways. So we're gonna meet the, the panelists now. I'll, I'll read their, their bios. We are joined tonight by the one and only <clears throat> Dr. Rose Brewer. Um, Dr. Rose Brewer is the Morse alumni um, distinguished teaching professor and past chairperson of the Department of African American and African Studies at the University of Minnesota. She holds affiliate appointments in gender, women's sexuality studies and sociology. Um, personally, when I attended the U of M, I think I took five courses with Dr. Brewer. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to continue to learn from her tonight. Uh, Dr. Brewer publishly, publishes extensively on the black radical tradition, black feminism, political economy, social movements, race, class, gender, and social change. She is one of the authors of the award-winning book, The Color of Wealth, a number of co-edited volumes, including the US Social Forum, Perspectives of a Movement, Bridges of Power, Women's Multicultural Alliances, and Is Academic Feminism Dead? Theory and Practice. Her most recent co-edited book is Rod Bush, Lessons from a Radical Black Scholar on Liberation, Love and Justice. Her publications include more than 80 essay, essays, articles, and refereed articles. As an activist scholar, Dr. Brewer is fully committed to building intersectional solidarity for a new society for the world's peoples and planet. She is a rare um, scholar in that you can see her in community as much as you can find her in the academy which is actually where I met her first was through grassroots um, movement work <clears throat> against police brutality and racial profiling um, probably 25 years ago. Um, <clears throat> Nonkululeko Shongwe or Nikuli Shongwe is the director of community wealth building at Nexus Community Partners. Nikuli Shongwe is a facilitator and cooperative enthusiast. She works at Nexus as the community wealth building director. She directs the North Star Black Cooperative, bringing Black-led cooperators and collectives together, grounding them in the history of Black cooperative economics. North Star sets space for our Black communities to reclaim the history and legacy of Black cooperative practices and use that wisdom to build on organizing efforts centered on our liberation. She serves as the vice chair for Taproot Investment Cooperative, Nikuli also serves on the City of St. Paul's Human Rights and Equal Economic Opportunity Commission. Thank you, Nikuli, for joining us tonight. Anisha Murphy, 
founder and manager of Just Law LLC. Anisha Murphy, she, her, a Twin Cities native, is the founder and manager of Just Law LLC. Just Law LLC's mission is to provide innovative, creative, and accessible legal resources to pr promote business growth for creatives, entrepreneurs, and business owners. Their vision is to equip businesses with the legal tools and knowledge to thrive. Sense of duty and impact drives Murphy in her career. Her ultimate desire is to have impact and close, close the disparity gaps, eliminate the racial wealth divide, and ultimately disrupt systematic and institutional barriers that result in unequal access to opportunity for black and brown communities. Welcome Anisha, thank you so much for being here with all of us. Um, we're gonna have a moment <clears throat> Um, in just a few, in, in just a few moments, we'll have some time to um, have the panel get going and we'll start asking them some questions, but to get us into this mindset of thinking deeply about the wealth divide and the wealth gap, we're going to watch a short clip um, from the 2024 Oscar nominated short documentary film, The Barber of Little Rock. This documentary follows the story of Arlo Washington who is a barber, a business owner, and a barber educator who launched a community bank in response to the financial redlining and economic violence in his city of Little Rock. <clears throat> the clip that we'll show, um, we'll, you'll get to see some folks describing their lived experiences living through the racial wealth divide. Um, Arlo Washington sums up economic justice as, as this. <clears throat> Economic justice is actually having an opportunity, a real opportunity. So simple as that. <laughs> um, the full documentary, which some of you, if you haven't seen it already, will probably want to see um, the whole thing. It's it's just about 35 minutes long and it's available on YouTube if you want to see that. But we can go ahead and watch the watch the clip. If the blood ain't circulating, then you're going to have some issues. So the blood has not been circulating for a long time. Why is it that we overlook this economically segregated community? Why is the issue swept under the rug and not talked about? For me, when I think about ownership, it's owning my own home so that I'll have something to pass down to my children. Nobody in my family own anything. So ownership is important to me because I want to create jobs and opportunities for my boys and my little cousins and my nephews. My oldest is 27 and my youngest is seven. Um, and I think about it a lot. Of course, nothing was passed down to me and I don't have anything to pass down to them. It just feels good to know that you have something that is yours that nobody can take away. For so long, we haven't had anything that was ours. Yeah, we damn proud of, you know, when we do own something, whether it's a Cadillac or a house or a boat. It's the idea of it belonging to you and that you can self-determine what will happen to it without having to ask anyone. You don't have to ask for permission. I've been making Philly cheese steaks and hoagies since I was 16 years old. I've been in restaurant business for 26 years. You have a food truck? Or I have a food truck. I have a food truck. truck, but my ambition within 12 months is to have a brick and mortar. So who do you bank with right now? Well, I... And, and did you consider them for getting the loan? They gave me an understanding that they wouldn't loan me any money. Really? They still want my business. They still want me to process my credit card payment. Your business is still making deposits in this bank that, yes, yes. in turn, will not make you a loan. Yes. The wealth gap has grown tremendously. The CDFI is a community development financial institution. All people matter. 
regardless of their credit history. We are not restricted. So I was at a traditional bank for nine years. Sadly, Banking Wild Black is um, a real thing. They don't necessarily train you to know that, but once you get in there and you actually see that the person coming in, if they're white, they're going to offer them credit cards, they're going to offer them loans, financing, you know, all of those. But you come in, you're black, there's no services offered. Uh, sometimes the interaction with the teller, it's, you know, you can see the difference in how they treat you. Uh, so I just don't, I just don't use banks. Banking while black does exist. Banking while black, driving while black, eating while black, your waiter or your waitress can treat you differently. I mean, there is just so many things. It's crazy the, the things that black people have to deal with. It becomes an experience that you just, you try to avoid. The disappointment of it. And rather than go through the frustration, you, you work around it. It's a workaround. Big banks, they don't know the community. They don't know them. They don't have a relationship. You know, and you want to be able to be sustainable, and you want to be profitable, exactly. and you want to be scalable. But we just want you to think about every aspect yeah, of and okay. best position yourself. This helps you to really build your credit profile. So we can provide you with some ongoing technical assistance to kind of help you along the way. We got the name People Trust because trust in the financial system is just not there. My goal is to restore the trust in a system that may have not been built for you. So we try to see what's the problem, how can we help, we find a way. I've always wanted to own my own business. I hear it so much. If you, if, I, if you could just give me a chance, just give me a chance to prove that I'm trustworthy, that I'm that I'm credit worthy, that I can run I can I can I can run this business successfully. Y'all ready? All right, one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven. Uh-uh, that should be a backhand. <laughs> she knew, she knew. Come on, let's go to one. Historically, barbers have been the go-to in the community. One of the oldest and most prestigious professions. They were the doctors, they did the bloodletting, they did the tooth pulling, they, did the, they were the priests. One customer lost his job. And he had been a faithful customer coming all the time. I mean, bringing his family, his kids, everybody, you know. He said, Mr. Washington, he said, uh, I'm down really bad, and I need to borrow $150. I've been a barber in the community for over 20 years. So when the community started hurting, what do you think they're going to come to? They came to the people that they can come to for help. He said, I I'm getting a job, and I can pay you back in 30 days. So I made him a loan. You know, I didn't think he was going to pay it back when I gave him the loan at the time. But he came back and he paid it back. And a couple weeks later, he came back again. Guess what he did? He paid me back. So I made him another loan. And he paid that loan back. So then we started thinking about, well, how can these small loans at that size really have an impact? If they don't have credit, then they can't get a loan from a bank. That means they have to go to a loan shark or they have to go to some payday lender that's going to never let them pay them off. And I thought about it and I said, wait a minute, this is what's affecting my community. So you see how it built up? Now, man, we didn't service like 2020, we served 900 folks. And so what we did was we applied to become a community development financial institution, which was put in place to be able to help low and moderate income communities that wouldn't otherwise receive the opportunity. Let him down and let him go. Come on in. In April of this year, my house caught a fire. So, you know, I was pushed out. Mm -hmm. I was calling to inquire about your uh, rental assistance. 
you're behind on rent now? I forgot your name. Give me your name again. Cancer. Okay. Cancer survivor. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's just a one-time deal. I believe we're the only rapid rehousing that is in central Arkansas. How much does it cost you to, to live every month? I don't know, because I ain't never been on my own. Okay. Have you been looking around? Yeah. I, don't. I had a landlord in today, and I asked him he doesn't have anything. And when you move, we'll pay the security deposit and your first three months rent. Let's talk about a budget. How's the job looking, Any? Well, uh, just, it's really that I'm, it's hard because I don't have nowhere to shower and stuff. Right. That is one thing about Little Rock. There's just really not a lot of affordable housing. There's a huge housing need. Right. There's just too many people waiting for help. You're four months behind, but did she tell you the balance? This is a grant, just an emergency grant, because I heard you say you didn't have any clothes, you didn't have any transportation, you, you know, if everything burnt it. up. For 17 days in a hotel? Man. <laughs> there you go. How much is the weekly rent? The weekly rent? Uh-huh. It's not weekly. She was just going to charge me like 525 a month. My mother, she she passed away with cancer. And uh, so I'm just thinking if, since you, you, you know, in that situation, maybe if we was able to do, you know, maybe a, a grant for a month, that'd give you time to find a place. How do you think that works? It'll help me I think lot. that'll help. <laughs> what you think? It'll help me a lot. Hey, Jay, you got any help? Most of the time, it's state of emergency. But I needed help like yesterday. We never got the 40 acres on the mule that was promised. That's like the big elephant in the room. This was promised to you. You never got it. Nobody never talked about it. It didn't come up in any type of other political discussions. And the fallout is what we see. A huge racial wealth gap, economic injustices, um, and no, no, not really an end to it in sight. Um, and like I said uh, earlier, um, the the Barber of Little Rock um, is available on YouTube, so you can watch it for free if you want to watch the whole story. Um, yeah, it's really it's really incredible um, and powerful to see what the community was able to build build together. Um, from here, we're going to move into our discussion with our panelists. Um, I've got a few questions, um, about five questions that, we, that we've that we prepared for um, the panelists. And, um, and we'll be moving through these. And then once we're done with the questions that, um, that we've come up with, we will open up uh, a time for Q&A for all of you that are have joined us tonight. Um, if you do have questions, if you want to use the Q&A function, that helps us really um, be able to track those questions really easily. We'll try and um, get them out of the chat if that's where you post them. Um, but the Q&A is really helpful. So our first question, um, we'd love to hear from, from each of you. I think I'll start with um, Dr. Brewer and then go to Nikuli and then to Anisha. Um, so our first question is just, if you could just tell us about your work and how your work contributes to building wealth in the Black community. Dr. Brewer? It's so good being here. Uh, lovely to see all the people who have joined online, many of whom I've known for a number of years. Um, I mean, I'm, my heart is full, actually. Um, and unfortunately, I'm having a little trouble with my computer, and I wasn't able to Correct that, so I'm on my iPhone. I, I'm not sure how that's projecting, but I, I hope you are able to hear me well. Uh, my work uh, was, um, shall we say, catalyzed by my own biography. Some of you know this biography, but I, I grew up in um, a city 
and in a state that stole uh, the wealth of the Black community of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, I know a number of you know that story. Uh, you can imagine what it means to live in what I would call a racially apartheid city after that devastation uh, had happened in 1921. So that was the, the foundational piece of my nurturing. And that nurturing was rooted in the expectation that we would work collectively because that was the only way we could really survive. I came out of a poor working class environment and as someone who's gendered female during that period, you can imagine uh, what that meant in terms of expectations. But I came out of a community and a family that urged education, that urged commitment to community and had high expectations for us. It didn't take long uh, to see the differentiation between what we call the South side of Tulsa and the North side of Tulsa. I always wonder why black folk live on the North side, but uh, that's where we were. And uh, such a dramatic difference once the, the violence of 21 happened uh, and then urban renewal uh, kicked in and the community reverberated back to some of the some of the ownership, but it was never, and it has never into the 21st century been quite the same. Um, so my rootedness and expectation around uh, the issue of wealth, and I would say class and gender and the inequality of capitalism certainly goes back to uh, my growing up years. And it has been the catalyst ever since in one way, shape or form, as uh, Danielle had mentioned, uh, always the expectation that we need to struggle collectively and intentionally to change the state of affairs. And I know that being uh, in this community for several decades now, uh, that has been the charge. Uh, one foot in the academy, but never totally there, but always with expectation that political, economic, and social change can happen and is in our hands. I hope I touched on the question uh, as you've uh, posed it. Yeah, you you definitely did. And um, I'm just struck by that statement that the expectation is that political, social, and economic change will happen, can happen. So thank you for that. Um, and so we'll move on to Nikuli. So could you tell us a little bit about how your work and about your work and how your work contributes to building wealth in the black community? Yeah, um, so I think I'm reminded of when I started at Nexus a few years ago, uh, Danielle asking me, why cooperatives? Like, why are you interested in cooperatives? And so my work involves um, like doing some cooperative, some black cooperative, cooperative education that's rooted in the history on legacy. Um, and for me, when I came to this work, I like to find myself, I like to see my history and ultimately it just made sense. It's like what we do at home, it's what we do with our family, it's what we do with our aunties and uncles. We come together and collaborate and collectively work on either parties, events, or hold each other because that's where the care lives ultimately in our communities. And so my work is really, like I said, about co cooperatives and cooperative education. It draws from the history and legacy of um, African-American cooperative economic thought and practice, talking about things like the Underground Railroad as a form of cooperation, talking about the fact that Black people were never really included in the larger markets, and so had to build markets for themselves, and that history and legacy continues on even today. I mean, as we were watching this video and thinking and looking back at, you know, emergency funds, I was thinking back to the height of the uprising, the height of the pandemic and how we we're able to regrant like I think $1.1 million in mutual aid and how that was so powerful, but wasn't nearly enough. And looking today at 2024, seeing that need still exist in so many ways, knowing that our communities do need these emergency access to funds to continue living, because like I said, the systems are never built for us. And so the work that I do really speaks to reclaiming that history and legacy and talks to economic organizing and how we can move beyond the systems that exist to take care for ourselves, our communities, our people in the best way that we know how, while creating spaces to build wealth, to build access for health, to take care of our elders, our children, and more. Thank you. 
Thank you, Nikuli. Um, listening to you talk about it, it sounds like this work kind of feeds you and gives you energy as well. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, um, it's definitely like the heart of everything I do. It's where I get a lot of energy. It's where I'm inspired because a lot of this cooperative work is definitely tied to our liberation in so many ways. And so I think that's why for me, it's so deeply, I, I'm deeply passionate about it, but because yeah, it's about us and what's better than us. I mean, I don't know, nothing really. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so Anisha, um, will you please tell us a little bit about your work and how your work contributes to building wealth in the black community? Yes, I just first wanna start off by saying, I am so honored to be on tonight's panel with just this distinctive, amazing group of black women. Um, doing amazing work in our community. Um, hi everyone, Anisha Murphy. I am the owner um, of Just Law LLC, which is a boutique business and estate planning law firm. Um, so my work is really designed around disrupting systems and providing access to opportunity and providing access to affordable, accessible legal tools and resources um, for our people, right? Um, and making it accessible in a way that we can understand it. I named my firm, and people don't know this, but just part of Just Law, my middle name is Justine, but it also is Just Law. It can be as simple as you make it. And oftentimes uh, dealing in systematic and uh, social constructs, we overcomplicate the law. And so I literally use my tools and resources to simplify the simplify the law and make it accessible so my people can thrive. Um, in addition to that, so I'm seeing some of the notes in the chat. A lot of people do know this, but may not know this. I am a vice president of partnership development at one of the largest national CDFI, so community development financial institutions in the nation. It, our, our name is uh, the Community Reinvestment Fund. And I, I always, when I watch that video, it always brings me to tears because um, just, just the organizing of us. And we really, we really got organized and provided access to capital in a lane um, that traditional banks weren't doing it. And I always know, not know a credit to mine, but during the paycheck protection era, as Nikuli highlighted, I was able to work with several of our local CDFIs to disperse $10 million in PPP loans to black and brown folks that looks like me. And so the power of CDFIs are real and I'm grateful that we're living up to the Civil Rights Act and really disrupting systems and making access to capital easier for underserved and often looked community. So I do a lot, but my work is really to find avenues and find ways to provide resources for my community and uh, speaking truth to power and doing that as well, right? So not being afraid to be on calls with people that don't look like me to challenge thoughts um, and, and um, to challenge thoughts so that we can get the resources to our community, whether it's you know, going back and forth with our, our internal team about our credit box system because the capital um, that we're deploying is not reaching the communities that we say we want to serve. Whether it's speaking to funders, like I was on a call with some execs at Wells Fargo about programs, right, to better serve Native and Black and Brown communities. So as you all probably can tell, my work is really rooted in moving the breaking systematic barriers that prevent my community from advancing. And I do that every day through my work in Just Law. And I'm also able and blessed to do it in my work in the CDFI space as well. So it's 24 seven for you, Anisha. <laughs> it's 24 <laughs> seven. <laughs> I always like joke with myself, like I can never cut this stuff off, but I'm like, if not me, who else? Right. And if I have to be in these tables by myself, I'm okay with that. Cause I carry a whole community behind me and that's, what's really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're alongside you too. Absolutely. You. Yes. Yeah. Um, so this next, next question is for you, Dr. Brewer. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why you, why you use the term racial wealth div divide as opposed to racial wealth gap and how it was created? Why is it important um, for us to frame it in that way rather than a wealth gap? Yeah, I would uh, even take that uh, a step further. Uh, 
is certainly a divide that, while not intractable, is rooted very deeply uh, in the history of uh, this country. I was really uh, struck by the statement that the system isn't made for us. But let's not forget uh, that it was enslaved Africans that built this system, that the tremendous wealth, uh, the wealthiest country in the world today that uh, excludes a significant number of its population uh, was built on the backs as well as the bodies of African people. Uh, I think we need to be very clear about uh, the system that we're asking to have admission into. Um, you know, I'm a, a very um, critical, critical analyst of this racial capitalist system that we live in. I don't like to mince words about it. Uh, certainly, uh, if you think about the divide, it is almost intractable. When you hear what uh, banks have done, uh, back to the video, when you hear what uh, our labor has not produced in terms of fair wages, uh, there's a struggle going on right now for fairness in terms of uh, the Lyft and the Uber drivers. I'm a historian, I'm a sociologist. I like to put the work that we do in those contexts because that'll give us, from my perspective, the kind of strategic orientation that we need to be much more transformative. Uh, I very much appreciate the other panelists and the work they're doing. However, I think we, and we always have asked uh, hard questions around what does it mean to be integrated into, to some extent, a burning house? And the answer has been that we respond with uh, self-determination. We respond with, uh, to some extent, struggle against the existing inequalities, but we always have had a vision uh, what some people are called an Afrofuturist vision. That's very different from the social order. And I think in the description that y'all have offered about the work of uh, Nexus, um, it lifts up the very real fact that uh, collectivity, cooperation, these are the values, the Ubuntu of our people from Africa to the Americas, ripped violently from that are the values the futuristic ideas, the collective commitment that uh, will drive and transform what I'm calling uh, the racial uh, divide, whether we call it a racial gap uh, or whether we call it a divide. The fundamental fact is that in this most, I would say exploitive society, we have to have, from my perspective, a different vision. In the interim, in the shorter term, how we build together, whether it be a cooperation, whether it be uh, shared housing, uh, with an eye not so much on property, but with an eye on uh, the next generations and what we can pass down to them in terms of values, wealth is more than money, in terms of uh, stable housing, in terms of food, shelter, medicine, and we need a very different system to accomplish all those things. So whether we call it a gap or whether we call it uh, a divide, uh, there is this deeply rooted uh, inequality that we can imagine from my perspective, a different way of being in the society and as well as in the world more broadly. Uh, so that would be my response, uh, Danielle. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. Can I ask um, a follow-up question quickly about, um, I think for many of us, it's difficult to envision something different. Um, and maybe the time to envision something different maybe comes in, in seasons or in certain spaces. I'm wondering for you, um, what has been a source for you or how do you even get into that space where you can imagine or envision um, a different system. What 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 um, gives you the the resilience and the energy to keep on envisioning something different for us? And to try to make it manifest, <laughs> I think uh, you're probably one of those people. Also, uh, you know, um, working uh, closely with other, uh, dare I say, uh, visionaries, uh, as someone mentioned on the panel. 
Uh, some of that was, I think it was Nkula who mentioned what happened during the uprising. But those are longstanding um, ideas about uh, what African people want, what black people want and what we need uh, as a people, not only in this society, but more broadly. So standing on the shoulders of those visionaries, of those people who are really able to sacrifice. Dare we mention um, Harriet Tubman, dare we mention so many others uh, who have led the way, uh, drawing upon their courage, understanding uh, the, I would say, the, the deep, deep uh, expectation. And I mentioned that in talking about my growing up years that it is an imperative for us uh, to struggle for a different kind of society, a different kind of world. And it's not just about us in the US. We live in a society that's very problematic for the world's people. So even if we got free in the richest and most robust way, we still have, from my perspective, an obligation to those almost 8 billion other people and to the African world from which we can trace uh, our, um, our heritage. And um, so the knowledge, the uh, connection with others who are in that struggle, you can't do it alone. The being strategic and in conversation, all of those are a part, I think, of uh, reimagining, uh, keeping the courage. And there's been a lot of sacrifice uh, by many. And I could go on and on and on, Danielle, but uh, I guess I would shape it in those ways. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Nkui, Black Cooperative Economics, what, what is that? How do you explain that to someone that is he hearing those words put together for the first time? How do, and then how do you work with Black co-ops? And um, could you tell us a little bit, a little bit more about um, about uh, why you support them. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm just gonna read like a little excerpt. Okay, so the the work that um, is really well, my my background is blurred, but it's really led by uh, driven by this book called Collective Courage: A History of African American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice by Dr. Jessica Gordon M. Hart, which is an anthology that talks about Black cooperation and that history. And in there, she talks about how African Americans have had a long, rich history of cooperative ownership, especially in reaction to market failures and economic racial discrimination. However, it has often been a hidden history, a one that has been obstructed by white supremacist violence. When there's a narrative, the history is told as one of failure. The challenge has been tremendous and often seen as insurmountable. And the successes have often been anecdotal or isolated or little understood and even less documented. And so when we think about what cooperatives are, essentially there's a space where people come together for a particular purpose to build or co-own something together. Those can look very differently. Those could be housing co-ops. They could be artist co-ops. They could be money lending circles or susus. Uh, credit unions as a form of cooperation. We have so many examples here in the Twin Cities of like those consumer co-ops like Seward and Mississippi Market. But the and um, one of my favorite his stories anyway comes from St. Paul with Crajafan, where it's a social club of young folks who opened up uh, credit unions and grocery stores um, and also just wanted a space for young folks to get together and party and then in turn help integrate a lot of the uh, hotels in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So cooperatives is a space where we really come together for some collective vision or collective idea and work towards that. Um, and like I said, it could be for, for varying reasons. And so that's largely what a cooperative is. And I just want to give note to that with the North Star Black Cooperative Fellowship that was developed at Nexus, started by Danielle Mkali, with a lot of wisdom from LaDonna Redmond Sanders, too. It's a space for us to really dive, dive deeply into that Black cooperative history and education and a space to reclaim that and figure out like what cooperation looks like now in community while uh, making sure that we uh, take note of the stories and the lessons and the history you know, from the Black Panthers, Fannie Lou Hamer, Dr. Brewer mentioned Harriet Tubman, who was often um, often um, told as the general of cooperators as well. And so there's this beautiful history about like of what Black cooperatives are and how they've existed and how, like I said, how we take care of ourselves is so different from what like is expected 
um, or what was told to here in the U.S. Uh, because you know we like the um, the Ubuntu, right? I see you, you see me, we see each other. We take care of each other in different ways from what is expected, and so cooperative cooperate cooperatives offer that space to do that. Um, and so we oftentimes in North Star work with cooperatives, like I said, to build that education, to have space for that, to learn from each other, um, and then um, continue supporting cooperatives post North Star in whatever they may need or may do. Some folks go on to build their own co-ops. There's a beautiful artist co-op in North called Your Mama's House from one of the um, from one of the advisory members here of Open Road Fund, uh, Ia Make. There's some beautiful cooperative, like housing co-ops here in the Twin Cities, Wilder Square, which is a black uh, led co-op slash section eight housing. Um, and so there's different ways. And yes, cooperatives are not a get rich now thing. They, they can be depending on how you value them, but they're really a space for us to come together to build wealth differently and recognize that oftentimes we've been pushed out of systems to build wealth. And so how can we uh, build, wealth, build wealth collectively or build wealth as a community? And so um, I hope that answered the question. I feel like I pulled from a lot of different things because once again, this is really exciting. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did absolutely answer the question. Um, Anisha, do you have any thoughts about Black cooperatives or do you engage with them in any of your work? Um, people coming together to collectively do things? All the time. I, again, in my work, both at CRF and then also my work at Just Law, have been really blessed and fortunate to come come together with some black co-ops or individuals wanting to start cooperatives as a form of of just for us by us right in a form of everything that um, Nikuli sort of highlighted around um, collective ownership, collective um, sh like shared interests, also thinking about finances, share risks, right? So you can share a lot of things with individuals. I will say that it is definitely a big move now. That's, you know, um, highlighting the work that you all are doing. Shared, uh, Share Capital um, is doing, highlighting the work that um, also, um, why am I blanking her name? Elena <laughs> at Farmer Nexus, uh, Elena um, at MCCD is doing just around the co-op movement. And the need, I think to Nikuli's point, the educational piece around how powerful co-ops are and can be from an economic standpoint, but just from a healing standpoint, um, I often find myself in those uh, conversations. Hmm. Dr. Brewer, is there anything you'd wanna add about Black cooperative economics, what it means to you? Um, yeah, if you work with them. Yes. Um... You know, you all probably are familiar with Corporation Jackson and the work they've done over the years in terms of um, a very, very fulsome notion of what uh, Black self-determination means in this society. Um, really a vision of uh, a kind of ecosystem that uh, is, I would say, uh, leveled up enough that large numbers of people can be sustained. That's one of the, uh, the challenges is um, to, to ensure that uh, more than a few, but you know, we're talking about 50 million people in this country who are of African heritage or African descent. That is a, that's a, a nation size group of folk. And uh, you know, I deal with data and statistics uh, to feed 50 million people, to have enough shelter and housing, the system has to change. It can't accommodate and won't accommodate that with a dip here, a drab there. Uh, the most exciting thing about the cooperative movement uh, is that that heritage that Nkuli mentioned, uh, we stand on that. Uh, it represents a different set of values uh, than the individualistic, competitive, I get mine, which is sometimes uh, the underpinning of the what you have to give to get resources from this system. If you approve of those values, then you know you might be lifted up. Uh, so um, it is one, I believe, tier in a broader effort to build the kind of 
I'm concerned about values uh, as well as uh, being able to sustain us as human beings and having a, a, a good relationship with Mother Earth. You know, we have communities now uh, in uh, and across this country uh, from Katrina on to Cancer Alleys. So, you know, this gets to be bigger. Uh, what kind of society are we going to live in and how are we going to live in it without, to some extent, challenging the operating principles of the one we are born into? Uh, so my mind is always uh, really um, placing uh, that strong set of values around collectivity, Ubuntu, uh, with its origin. Uh, I just uh, taught recently uh, uh, Walter Rodney's How Europe Undeveloped Africa. And one of the things Rodney said that I think we should keep in mind, that there was nothing in those societies that would have made the way for capitalism or racial capitalism without colonialism, imperialism, enslavement. So we come from a set of societies, cultures. And of course, of course they're all now enveloped in this world system. Uh, but uh, always harking back uh, to those verities, understanding that living uh, in this uh, Twin Cities, living in the United States means uh, coming together uh, collectively, socially, uh, tying into that history that Nkuli put on the table and making a way uh, that is fundamentally different from how we're channeled in terms of what it means to succeed in, in this society. Uh, so uh, again, one foot in the academy and uh, most of my body in a relationship with others who are trying to imagine a kind of Afrofuturism, which is fundamentally different from uh, what we're having to contend with at this moment. It's about wealth, but it's not wealth for wealth's sake, it's wealth for uh, the, the sake of the well-being of uh, many, many, many people. Uh, I'll check it at that. <laughs> hmm. um, so Dr. Brewer has given us a lot to chew on with that. Um, and I love that piece about, um, again, kind of coming up to this place of imagining something that's fundamentally different. And so how does, how do, how do black economics, black power, bring us black economic power? Um, how can we use that to bring us closer to something that's fundamentally different? Um, Anisha, um, back to you. Uh, when you think about economic ownership and power, how does that relate to the tools you offer businesses to sustainably develop, grow, and build equity? And I know that you probably do that um, with both of your different hats, with Just Law um, and the CDFI work. And so feel free to speak to both of those things. We would love to learn more about that. Yes, for sure. So I'll start with the Just Law work. So for me with Just Law, it's it's and it's not just businesses. Also, I extend to individuals as well. But it really is the asset legacy building, right? So how do you gain assets that you can pass on or keep and use it to eat you know, your kids' kids are now eating off these assets. So it's either through a trademarks and copyrights. So, so many people don't realize the power of their name or the power of their business and how to really protect that through a trademark. People don't realize the power of your intellectual works and how do you really protect that through a copyright. People don't even realize the power of a contract, right? And like how a contract can save you and others um, as you are doing work with um, with others um, so that's, it's really about how do we take the legal tools and resources that are out there and, and win with them, right? Whether it's through a trademark, whether it's through utilizing contracts and everyday business practices, whether it's incorporating things like, um, things like, why am I blanking on the name? Things like, um, uh, uh um, why am I blanking? <laughs> things like, what is the name? Um, when you retire, but it, it's not a retirement plan, um, succession planning, right? And thinking about succession planning and who will take over my business when I'm ready to give it up or when I'm ready to sell, what is the plan for me? 
And then also baking in the legacy building stuff. So people think about uh, legacy building is 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 certain things. Legacy building is estate planning at its core. And how are we teaching the elements of estate planning and, and the right estate planning tools and templates that really guarantee, guarantee long-term success? There are so many misnomers about wills. Wills are great, you all, but depending on the type of assets you have, a will is not going to do it for you. And in fact, a will is nothing more than a document for consideration. You list out your wishes um, based off of the assets that you have. And then you, when you pass, that wish list gets you into what we call probate court. And ultimately the judge decides what happens to the assets. Um, and they take in testimony from interested individuals that want to um, have, right, they, that want to have a stake in your interest, et cetera. Trust are the holy grail to asset building and really wealth building and legacy uh, building. But people don't tell you that, right? I mean, there's so much understanding around how asset or legacy um, planning works that you have a lot of information about wills and very limited information about trust. But if you have things like children, if you have uh, assets such as a home, multiple properties in multiple different states, your best um, legacy tool is a trust because your assets pass according to your wishes almost immediately and not it's very private so that's another thing it, it, the things that pass in a trust they pass according to the trust document and it doesn't have to go into probate so so many people don't realize that in addition to that people think oh legacy building or legacy um you know a state plan it stops with if with having a will or a trust but there's also things that come into play when you don't, or when you become incapacitated, such as a healthcare derivative or a power of attorney that is baked into your legacy building, your asset building that should be considered um, as you are thinking about passing on assets to your family. So I have things called just facts where I break down um, just everything we're talking about right now, how to start estate planning, what type of tools do you need um, to consider when, while, as you are estate planning. And the same is true for the business assets. Like what is a, a operating agreement? What type of entity should use an operating agreement? What are the different entities that Minnesota recognizes? Because so many people don't realize that a nonprofit is nothing more than another business entity and what happens to the dividends at the end of the year is really what matters, right? Because in a nonprofit, you, you can't pass that many on to a shareholder. It has to go into reserves to support additional programming for years to come. Whereas in a for-profit entity, you can pass that money to shareholders in a co-op, et cetera, right? So that's really what I like to do is I like to break down the tools and resources and then provide it at a very accessible rate to um to my to people, right? So whether it be black and brown, underserved, or it be women, you know, disabled, et cetera. And then in the space with the um with um the CDFI lane, it really is creating um affordable capital that is going out into community. So at CRF, our North Star is small business. So we don't touch housing co-ops. We work with partners on the ground that do it. Um, but it's making sure our products and services that are going out into community align with the needs of community. One notable product that launched in the height of the pandemic was called the Minnesota Inclusive Growth Fund, where we pulled 5% interest only, I mean, sorry, 5% fixed interest rate capital and match that with technical assistance so that small businesses now we're, we're not only getting the capital but getting wraparound services to guarantee long-term success so danielle i feel like i've been talking for a while that's a long-winded <laughs> response to your question but i think it's really about centering the community at the solutions and then designing the solutions with community at um at at the center um to guarantee long-term success and i and i find that to be true both in my just law practice and my work in the cdfi space thank you so much nisha <clears throat> um we know that all of you have expertise in the area of economic ownership um what what are your recommendations in, about how to build economic ownership and power? Dr. Brewer? 
Let's start with economic power. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might go for that one first. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm always uh, mindful of the critical mask. Um, you know, we live in a society where there always are a tier of people who uh, have enough of a threshold that they can do some of the things that make for, say, a better life. Our problem has to do with the critical mass question of how many people uh, are we able to reach given uh, the economic tools that we have. Uh, that's one of the reasons that the collective cooperative model is of uh, such potency from my perspective. Uh, you know, we shouldn't be um, shy about saying we live in a city. When you talk about how traditionally wealth is passed on, it's typically passed on, uh, and we have other experts on this panel, but it's passed on, of course, intergenerationally. And as was, was said, you have to have something to pass on, whether it's in the form of a trust, whether it's in the form of, uh, of equity. There's a policy issue here in these cities where not even 30% of the black population is in a position of home ownership. We can break that down uh, very explicitly. We live in a city where 80 plus percent of the white population have homeowners. This resource, this source of equity will be the basis that their children will build their wealth on. We've got to take a slightly different, from my perspective, approach to this for economic power. Uh, either the system is going to have to dramatically change uh, the way resources are allocated. Uh, COVID offered a window where we know there are resources that can provide two to three to $500 a month for families to get on their feet. That's a given in this most rich of societies. That's a political question. From the bottom up, doing many of the things that uh, the panelists have suggested, makes a lot of sense, but there's a critical mass issue of who has access to those. We have a class question that we have to contend with. There is enough of a middle and working class that many of these tools are very helpful, but for the majority of the 50 million people who are black, having a roof over our heads, getting a living wage, being able to provide food, clothing and shelter, requires a different set of demands, a different kind of political power. It means coming together. And I think, you know, if you look at the history of our people, they recognize this. the 40 acres and a mule didn't happen. But if you don't have the 40 acres and a mule, what do you have to do? You have to come together and pull, whether it's a rent coming together to do rent to raise money. Uh, but we have to, I think, let me put it this way that in this powerful, this most powerful of capitalist societies, the point is profit. Whenever you go into a bank, they're going to be looking at several things. And as we saw in the film, uh, if you can't provide those things, you aren't going to get through the door. Don't let me talk about Wells Fargo and their policies. I'm naming names. But what I imagine economic power about is that are systematically coming together, doing the cooperative piece as a, as, a, as a big aspect of that, but building on what our people have uh, always known that in this society, it's always a political struggle. It's a political demand, uh, whether it be Dr. King, whether it be uh, what happened uh, with Black Lives Matter, it's from the bottom up that more broadly this system moves. Uh, it will provide resources along the edges, but we're talking about resources and economic power for the majority of our people, not the minority of our people. And that is a, a political, a societal question that we can't get around contending with uh, you know, these broader systems, whether they be banks, whether they be the US government, whether they be whatever. So it's a two-pronged kind of strategy from the bottom up, from what we can do for ourselves in terms of organizing, self-determination, 
building cooperatively, acting collectively, powerful tool. But we're in the middle of a society also where we pay taxes that has an obligation uh, provided our blood, sweat, and tears. So that's another component of the struggle that I believe we uh, must be engaged in. And I've gone a little bit long, but it's that economic power is rooted in that uh, two-pronged strategy, the self-determining collective aspect, the building cooperatively, but also not letting the broader society off the hook, uh, given uh, our positioning within it. Mm -hmm. Check. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Brewer. Um, things that we can walk with um, for a long time and be challenged by. I am listening to you talk. Um, reminds me of when I um, I read that book, um, High on the Hog. Mm -hmm. And um, in it, I was surprised to find out that um, oftentimes, um, some of the, um, our ancestors that had been, um, enslaved as like the chefs in some of these, um, people's homes and eventually, um, uh, maybe got free and, or, um, and would start catering businesses or, um, started some of the first like oyster businesses, um, in, on the East coast of Maryland, a lot of the money that they got um, was always going into starting abolition um, committees and funding the movement. And throughout the history of co Black cooperative economics, all of the movement spaces have been tied to people coming together to Absolutely. take whatever profits they had made cooperatively, whether they're starting their businesses to help move the collective forward. And so I think that's a really powerful um, push for us to continue to think about as we're grappling with this economic ownership and power for what, right? <clears throat> so thank you. Um, Nikuli, what are your recommendations about how to build economic ownership and power? Yeah, um, I think one of the things, so many things are coming together, but I think one of the things when you think about economic power is really challenging some of the systems in place now. Um, one of the things I love about Open Road Fund is that it's like it's it's a it's an example of like what re reparative justice looks like, and I think so. Ultimately, thinking about like reparations for those that are descendants of the enslaved, and I mean, in the video was mentioned like the forty acre and a mule that it was never received, and so what does it look like to make sure that we built like there's a system in place for the Black folks that were. Uh, impacted by the slave trade to have a space to even start to build wealth, to even start to heal. I mean, there's no number that will ever, ever, ever be enough. And there's no number that will ever, ever, ever like truly heal the atrocities of what happened in this country. But I think in terms of like organizing around economic power and ownership, like that's where it starts. I feel like we all say when we do, we all do better when we all do better. <laughs> like, but like that has to be followed with some like dollars. And I think that starts with uh, a reparative fund and reparations um, largely supported um, nationally in the US. Um, I think when thinking about organizing around economic power, it's just really looking at what places and systems are in place right now. When we're thinking about cooperative economics, like we can't do this work alone. Um, seeing some folks on the call, like Rondo Community Land Trust, uh, thinking about the work that MCCD, uh, the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers is doing, thinking about the Northside Investment Cooperative Enterprise. It's gonna take multiple strategies for us to get to a place where we can see like liberation, where we can see ourselves really exist, like what Dr. Burr say, where we can see ourselves really reimagine what it looks like to live outside of those systems in place. So just like really leaning into like the economic the the ecosystem work that's uh, happening right now, continuing to build and organize together to achieve something different. Um, I really loved in the video, and I hope you all get to watch it. But one of the things that was said is that, you know, if you keep doing this, it's going to scare them because it's, like it shows us like what it shows them what we're capable of. And I think we're even seeing that with a lot of the policies that are coming in place, like targeting like black centered work, um, targeting affirmative action and all these things, because I think when they see what we're capable of, when we see when they see that we know that there is another thing that we can lean to and not this thing that they have given us that is weird and murky, that there is so much power in that and that we can move so much. And so I think it's like really coming back to that reimagining re piece and really figuring out and seeing like the power and what we can do moving forward. 
Um, in terms of economic ownership, yeah, collective ownership. Um, when we I was getting ready for this, I live in Prospect Park, and I was thinking of the Simpson family that was really run out of Prospect Park because there were a Black family living here in the 1900s, the 1920s, and thinking about redlining and um, and all these other the things that were in place and thinking about how collective ownership can sort of, sort of help support, well, now, provide a safer space or space for us to collectively own so not one person is targeted, as Anisha mentioned earlier. In, co in a cooperative, we saw during the pandemic that, you know, lots of cooperative businesses ended up being more sustainable in the pandemic because there was more than one owner in place. When there's an individual or a sole proprietorship, you know, and you are at risk, that's your own risk to hold. Like you can't, you can't share that risk with anyone else. But if we're able to share the risk with other folks to hold us, then we're able to go a little bit further and a little bit longer. And so, yeah, just really leaning into cooperatives, cooperative economics, really leaning into this, the, eco, the ecosystem that's in place, organizing this work, and also leaning into reparations and moving that forward, because that's definitely necessary and needed and changing all of this and, uh, and seeing something different for all of us. Thank you, Nikuli. Um, Anisha, what recommend recommendations um, do you have for us about how to build economic ownership and power? Yeah, I will plus one or a gazillion over what Dr. Brewer said and the coolie shared. Um, for me, I think it's also about giving ourselves grace. I mean, we've been through so much as a people, <laughs> right? I mean, we just really have, um, and they can't kill us. So that, to Nikuli's point, just shows how powerful we are and how resilient we are, no matter what society throws at us. Um, as far as sort of traditional legal realm um, and the estate planning, I think also we we often think once it comes down to, to passing generational wealth, that it has to be a multi-million dollar estate or that it has to be a big thing. We need money, but as long as you have a bank account, that is something that can be passed down. So I would say, and this is one thing I learned while I was working at Neon, which that, that story um, that we, uh, the video, the Little Rock video, it always reminds me of Neon. It, it just really does in the power of micro lenders. But where I was going with this was, um, was um, they had a phrase and they continue to have this phrase of think big, start small, right? Like the game wasn't designed for us to win <laughs> at all, but they, to Nakui's point, see how resilient we are. And, and so as long as you have a bank account, as long as you have a ring that you was passed down, like through an heirloom, as long as you have um, the clothes on your back, those things can be passed down and be, be liquidated to help you build sort of wealth. So I would say, um, think big and think Think big, but start small. Don't feel like you have to have that million dollars before or even thousands of dollars before you start to think about legacy building and estate planning and what assets do you want to leave behind in the event that you um, are no longer here? Because as we've seen with someone that was so little like Takeoff, right? Formerly of the Migos, he died at 29 years old, didn't have anything in place and we know not the time or reason when the Lord is going to call us home. So as soon as you start to build certain things or have certain things, like I like to tell people, as long as you have a bank account, that's an asset that you can pass down to the next generation or, or to a, a charitable organization, however you wish to decipher um, where, your, where your assets go is important. But if we think we have to, you know, we don't know enough or we don't have enough information. We oftentimes get um, really, um, really, um, uh, what is the word? We often, I don't know why I'm tongue tied today. I'm never tongue tied. We oftentimes get really um, sort of embarrassed or feel like we don't know anything or, you know, we don't want to move to that next phase, but just know that you have enough and you are enough and we are in it together. So you don't have to do this by yourself. Um, and that's why I really love the work that Nexus is doing. Even before the open road fund, Nexus was in the ground and in the weeds doing this work. And it's just a tribute to everything that you all are doing. So thank you again for allowing me to share space tonight. 
No, thank you so much, um, Anisha, for the work that you're doing. Um, and the Open Road Fund is is one of these strategies um, out here. And we definitely could not do it without all of the work that all of you are doing. Um, and so part of these Black Wealth Community Education Sessions is for us to be able to you know, um, grapple as a community with what Black wealth actually means, what Black economic power, um, what it means when we organize with these things together and to learn more about what everyone is up to um, so that we can make those connections and, um, and reconnections sometimes and make sure that we're tapped into all of the incredible resources and, and knowledge that's out here. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, I think right now that's it for the questions that we have prepared. Um, we can take just like maybe a couple minutes, um, maybe just a minute. And um, for folks that are here, okay, we're going to take two minutes is what I'm being told. <laughs> Um, and we're going to put a, a survey, I think, in the chat that if you all would be so kind to take a look at and fill out. And then if you could think about if there's any um, more questions um, or questions that come to mind for our panelists tonight, um, we'll move into the, um, the participants, the audience Q&A. Uh, we've got a few to work through already, um, but we'd love to hear from more of you. So we'll be back at about All righty, it's 724. So extra minute, but we'll bring folks back so we can open it up for Q&A. All right, we have, we have a wonderful question. Um, I think it's, it's either Davy or, or Davy Mims. I'm going to say it's Davy, I'm guessing. Um, the question is, how can the arts contribute to the Black 
economic community work? You know, <laughs> if you don't mind me stepping into that question, uh, whenever I hear that question, I'm always thinking about Tony Cade Bambara, who says that the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. And, uh, you know, you can take that uh, however you want, but without the political wherewithal of the artist, uh, the kind of deep level political and social change that we need will not happen. That's the motivator. That's the inspirator. That's the incubator. So the arts are absolutely essential. Can I add to that? Uh, I would say, you know, for me, the the arts are the heart of this work. To what Dr. Dr. Rose uh, Brewer was just saying, and artists should be respected as as business owners, right? They should definitely be respected as business owners in the contributions that they create and make in our economy. And so, I just want to highlight an organization that I sit on the board for, Springboard for the Arts, that is doing a lot around artist development and making sure artists are respected in at least Minnesota, and they're expanding too, um, but at least in Minnesota in the work that they're, in the con contributions that they're making to our, our economy um, as entrepreneurs, as um, uh, solo business owners, et cetera. So shout out to Springboard for the Arts, but to the point that Dr. Brewer raised, they, they're the heart of this. They're, without the arts, we wouldn't be able to sustain or even make it through these this work um and it's now but also right in, in slavery if you think about the slaves and they sang hymns and they did all this stuff to just sustain so it's it's a, the heartbeat of why black economic um empowerment is so important and it's the heartbeat of of our work yeah i mean that's where all our stories are told that's where they come from. That's where all the culture lives and is disseminated. So essentially, it is essential and a center to like economic empowerment work for sure. I'm not going to add any more because I feel like Anisha and Dr. Rose <laughs> did all of that. But yeah, it's definitely the center of this work in so many ways. I would only add one other thing. Uh, we know that, but back to the point that y'all were making, why is so little valued uh, in terms of even making it almost impossible for creative folk, uh, what we call kumba, uh, to 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 live, to to make a living, and uh, you know it doesn't have to be that way, uh, and to respect the artists and to uh, compensate as well as uh, provide space, and all those things are are part of this. I think conversation we're we're having about uh, economic power. <clears throat> yep dr brew reminding us it doesn't have to be that way and so you know, <laughs> imagining you know if it weren't that way if if artists um and i would say probably so many more of us would say we are artists if we could actually live and and make our art you know um, so if, if housing was guaranteed, um, if healthcare was guaranteed, um, if food was guaranteed, how many more of us would, um, be creating things, um, beautiful things for each other to share with one another. Um, so thank you for that. Um, another question that came up is what is the best financial institution for black real estate investors? Anyone want to take that one? <laughs> and I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I'll say this, it, this answer is it depends because there are different spaces and we often work with each other, right? Like Felicia just sh said in the chat, there is no single institutions. So CDFIs, our partners are the banks. We don't look at them as adversary to our work. We look at them and know it's necessary that we work collectively um, in order to move the work forward and also to dismantle the systematic barriers that exist. And so for me, it depends. It depends on what you're trying to do with your, you know, the real estate development. It depends on whether or not uh, different uh, different partners can come together, even into collective and uh, cooperative uh, model, um, finance a deal, we call that participation lending. So 
I, I, I don't think that there's no one single institution and they're, they're all hold power. And to be quite honest with you, we work in partnership with each other every day. Thank you for that. Um, another question is any advice for um, financial? Oh, I just scrolled right by it. One moment. Oh, there it is. Any advice for financial wealth building for someone who is legally disabled and lives on a small government income? Or if you don't have advice, are there any resources that come to mind that maybe they could um, look into that might be able to help? Open roll fund. <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely. Um, I know the Cultural Wellness Center is launching um, a second um, cohort, or I think their application is out right now, and I blank on what the name of, of the program is, but it's Cultural Wellness Center in partnership with Polad Foundation. Um, yeah, those are the two that I can really think of right now. The Legacy Fund through the um, Wellness Center in Polad, yep. Okay. <laughs> Just in a bigger context, um, you know, uh, what a powerful uh, statement that the person just shared. Uh, and you think about uh, what I said earlier, is not that the resources could not be provided. It is the reality that they won't be provided because of uh, the political context in which we live. We know that, uh, that uh, those who are disabled, uh, uh, our young people, our children, uh, elders, the whole nine. What is it about a society? And I have an article in the resources about too much wealth. How do you, uh, you build that uh, connection between hyper wealth uh, and these are people who are going to pass down millions and tens of millions to another generation of likely white children and little or no wealth where we have a, a, a attendee who uh, just very humbly said, uh, how can they build wealth on a, on a limited income? I mean, it just really, if, if you don't feel like uh, being a radical and a revolutionary, just hearing that testimony says there's something radically wrong with that equation where so few have so much and those who are deserving, uh, surely that's not the kind of society that we want. Uh, but anyway, uh, just me preaching a little bit. <laughs> um. Someone added in the um, chat also that um, Lutheran Social Services could potentially be a resource. But in terms of like these questions that are coming up in the chat, as we think about other resources as well, um, we'll make sure that we are um, making note of those and we will share those on um, with all of you that are that are here tonight. Um, Let's see here. Another question that came up is, um, does anyone know about the Ariel Investment Company, a black company that has been around since 1983? And what are your thoughts about investing to build wealth? Well, actually, you know, given the kind of society uh, we live in, that's probably one of the few ways that you do build built wealth by very um, particular kind of investments. We know that uh, if you have um, uh, an employer who um, uh, uh, accepts 501, uh, what is it? Uh, what's the, the funds that uh, they pay into and you pay into as a, as a, as an employee, uh, so, you know, entities like Van, yeah, Vanguard, uh, Fidelity, all it oftentimes those are, for example, at the university, that's the investment tool. It's not an individual investment. Say you don't have that, 
that uh, that access. Uh, you know, there are freelance folk who do uh, stocks and bonds. Uh, there's a whole infrastructure of financialization where people just make money off of money. Uh, but we do know for a fact, I mean, we talked about housing as equity and uh, how that can be passed on, but a, a major way that uh, uh, money is made in this society is through uh, investing in uh, entities like um, bonds, stocks, IRAs, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, the compounding of interest, uh, that's the, the bread and butter of uh, racial capitalism. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure about this investment uh, company, but I think uh, some of the other ways too that folks are thinking about uh, Ariel, one of the other, some of the other ways folks are investing is thinking about like how to invest in community ownership uh, together. So that could be through like real estate investment cooperatives. I named a few like the Northside Investment Co-op. Uh, there's the Northeast Investment Co-op. There's Taproots in St. Paul and Midway Investment Co-op. And essentially those are uh, structures where community members come together to purchase an entity. It could be um, commercial or it could be housing. And depending on how those bylaws are built out, there could be a certain amount, a percentage that you get um, over time. It's not a large percentage, so it's not gonna look like your traditional investment methods, um, but it's uh, it could be like four to 8% um, of returns in like 10 years. But that's also then very much rooted in values and then you investing in the community to keep it as it is or to um, try to kind of limit gentrification or other things. So, yeah, there are for sure these traditional investment methods, but there are also spaces where we can th uh, rethink or reimagine what investment looks like when you invest back in our communities. That's more um, accessible and more affordable and intergenerational as well, because that process is normally open to anyone like 18 plus. I would say, in addition to what Nikuli just shared, I think um, also just rechanneling and recreating what uh, wealth looks like for you, right? Because you don't have to go the traditional route of, I want to invest in these stocks and bonds and all of those different things. Wealth could look like to you of, I have one house and I'm going to put it in the trust to pass it down to my and my children split the proceeds when I die or something like that right um so you I mean Ario is great they have I think 95 percent of their staff is black I know they just appointed a black coal um CEO of the organization but that's all I know about it I think um everything that Nakui highlighted and also thinking about donor advice funds and how you can invest and create wealth that way, right? Um, and it may not be wealth for yourself, but you may be creating community wealth, um, which the return may be that much greater depending on how you yourself define what um, wealth building looks like. Thanks for that, Anisha. So this one is specifically for Dr. Brewer. Um, and I think I think it's a, a great question because, um, because I know that you'll have a great answer for it. Um, but Dave says that I have it that politics is politics. So what do you see economic power being grown outside of politics? We didn't create the system, so there is no control of it or its changes that won't simply change again and again and again. This is the context from where my question derives. Mm -hmm. So politics, well. Politics. Yeah, obviously, uh, Dave has uh, real issues with uh, with politics. Uh, traditional politics are that, uh, especially in this society. But, uh, you know, living is political in a lot of ways. We make uh, strategic choices. Uh, you just heard uh, in this past uh, minute or so uh, what wealth building uh, mechanisms you want to use is a value rooted is a political question in a lot of ways. I, I guess I'm saying it's hard to uh, disconnect from uh, some kind of uh, political stance, whether you know you call it that or, or not. Uh, the history that I know, uh, the history that I lift up is a history of a people who always understood that it would take struggle. It would take political organization 
from those first enslaved Africans on slave trips, uh, ships. They had to be strategic about whether they were going to jump off the side of that uh, that ship and say they'd rather be in the ocean than be enslaved or uh, coming to this society, deciding that uh, they were going to rise up. Uh, and there were hundreds of rebellions, uh, both uh, from the early years of this country, whether they were going to organize as abolitionists, as uh, um, Sister Harriet Tubman did. Uh, she said if they understood what system they were up against, she probably could uh, free hundreds of more. I, I, I simply don't see how we can make a rational um set of sensibilities without having a sense of what what have our people done to get free uh that's the power of knowledge uh learning and also the actual concrete uh reality of what people have done in this city to make things possible uh so i don't see it out a politics yes but not outside of a reason collective strategic orientation to how we're going to make our lives better and not on the terms of those who this system wasn't built for because we could always be operating on their terms but on our terms and that means we talk to one another that we in communication with one another that we have multiple discussions like this uh over time continuously uh and uh, you know there have been some successes. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, without that kind of politic, uh, we would still be enslaved. And you know some people say that the prison industrial system is another form of that. So the struggle continues. Uh, strategy, collectivity, uh, building for uh, a world that has human values rather than uh, the values of exploitation profit and uh, individualism. That's my response. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All the jewels dropped. Um, <laughs> this next question is for anyone. Um, I, I really love this question. And in particular, as, as many people throughout our conversation tonight have lifted up this idea around legacy, um, but how can we teach black wealth building to our young children that are not even being read, being read to in our school systems. I think about when I think about that question. I was just watching this the other day, um, the story about the Panthers and how they sort of took took uh, the onus of the next generation in their own hands, whether it was forming what we now know as WIC, right, the um, beginning school. Um, uh food food care system uh food care program and all these different programs so i think it's we it almost uh put the onus on us right the only one who's going to teach the next generation the information that's being stripped away from them is us and we can't look for anyone else to sort of educate our children but us so it has to really be a for us by us model and I, that's why I think spaces like this is so important because in, in partnering up with other organizations that's doing similar work is so important because um, we, I mean, nobody else is going to teach us. Nobody, nobody is here to save us, but us. Um, and so I think, you know, um, just uh, the work that Junior Achievement is doing around like youth entrepreneurship is really important. <laughs> design curriculum that does, is not designed for black and brown students, right? Um, so again, yeah, I just think it's really, the onus has to be on us um, and designing programs that teach our students and our children things that the traditional education system is just not going to. I mean, we're seeing bad in the box happen in every state, like, or getting ready to try to happen. So we have to put the onus back on us if we want to survive and, and make sure the next generation understands legacy building and how to do it. <laughs> and that's what's really important. And for me, honestly, that's why I started to do a state plan. And I adopted my two nephews in 2019. And I looked around and I was like, I don't got nothing to leave them if I got sick or something happened to me. So I started to educate myself and then started to educate them then started to educate my family and my community, et cetera. So 
I didn't, I wasn't looking for anyone to save me. It was really, how do I save the people that I'm responsible for, which are these two amazing humans that didn't ask to be here. Yeah, I think really amplifying uh, some of those community-led um, organizations and spaces. I'm thinking of some of the work that Ms. Raquette led with Imhotep, thinking about WeWin Institute here in St. Paul uh, that has a space for young folks to really um, even, you know, talk about like what it looks like, what that history or that space looks like for them, and then be reflected back either through Kwanzaa or all these other spaces that are really important. Um, and I'm thinking also of Youth Prize, which is currently working on building like a youth housing co-op. And that work is like being stewarded by youth. So like Anisha said, that work is really going to have to come from us, but also really relying on spaces and community where it's already built out to teach the young folks about wealth building, whether it's the traditional or the cooperative, um, anything that is not really taught in schools or doesn't have a space, well, there's just no space for it in schools right now. Um, Nikuli, I think this question is regarding, well, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it is uh, regarding cooperatives, but it says, where can you get information to understand how to set the proper appropriate bylaws that support all throughout? Uh, yeah, so there's ver various ways. Uh, depending on what cooperative you're building, it could be that you find another co-op that is doing similar work and uh, cooperative. One of the principles is like cooperation amongst cooperatives. So it could be that you find a cooperative that is doing similar work and ask to see their bylaws and then go from there. When creating a co-op and the bylaws, that that phase is often um, worked together with a, an attorney. Uh, and so finding an attorney to help create some of these bylaws um, or uh, I think I had another one, but I forgot. I forgot it briefly. Or you can come to, yeah, you can come to us at Nexus. Um, I'm happy to either share a resource or point you to a resource or um, our sister community wealth building team members, the Shared Ownership Center at Nexus. They work more on the technical assistance side of cooperatives. So that could be a space that you work with them to kind of help establish this. But ultimately it's work that's done by a lawyer but if you do find a co-op that has similar, I don't know, similar values, a similar mission, then like reaching out to them to use that as a basis is probably like your best bet because then you don't have to recreate anything. You can just take what's been created and adapt it for yourself. Can I add can to we, that really quick? I'll oh, go right ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, this is one uh, place where it's good that uh, we're talking about Minnesota because uh, there are impediments to building cooperate, uh, cooperatives in other parts of the country. Uh, I mentioned cooperative uh, cooperation Jackson. They're running up against the state of Mississippi that has pretty much uh, made it uh, illegal to build certain kinds of uh, cooperative entities. So Minnesota is good in, in that regard. Uh, go right ahead, Anisha. Yeah, Minnesota has some of the most favorable laws as it relates to uh, co-ops in the nation. That's why a lot of co-ops will actually register under Minnesota law and they'll be a foreign state. So they'll be somewhere else, but they'll be running their business or operating in Minnesota. In addition to the resources that Nikuli shared, um, the Sustainable Economies Law Center is a awesome resource if you want to just get... Um, some templates around bylaws for co-op businesses. They do a lot of work. I'm actually a, it's, it's called SELC, but I'm actually a SELC fellow. I've been one since I graduated in 2014 from law school. And so they're doing a lot of work and helping tons of businesses nationally um, um, with the their bylaws and helping to structure and all of these different things if you are interested in forming a co-op business. In addition, I will say the city of Minneapolis also has resources, depending on if you want to operate, um, with their CTAC program as well. Um, I, I saw a comment in the chat that, um, from that was saying that um, receiving a grant from like the one time $50,000 grant, either from Open Road Fund or from another foundation could um, uh, disqualify someone from receiving their disability benefits. And 
I'm not sure about how um, all of the benefits would be impact, all different like public types of benefits would be impacted by receiving the grant. But I did just want to share the information in terms of how um, Nexus is treating um, those grants and that they are um, designated through our 501c3 organization as a charitable gift. So we are not, um, we are not actually um, treating them as income in any way. And so we worked with um, a legal team to be able to understand and evaluate our program and feel confident that they are um, charitable gifts. So if that um, provides any further information that might be useful to someone that's considering whether or not to apply to receive that grant, um, I thought I would share that. Um, DA, I saw your question about um, could Nexus leverage our relationship with Bush around um, getting venture capital out of Bush's endowment um, to be invested in ORF or awardees or grantees? We haven't done that yet, but um, I'm I'm down for leveraging whatever more resources can be used um, to help support ORF awardees and would absolutely um, be happy to talk to you more about that. And I know that there are actually the there there are people at the Bush Foundation that are trying to do or are working on doing more um, impact investment work there as well. Um, and then Anisha, there were just a few questions kind of about trademarks, um, you know, wills and um, estate planning and um, is there a place where they should go or um, what do you think are like the best next steps? Can they learn more from you specifically about those things? Yeah, for sure. So um, in the interest of time, so I would say just book a consultation call on my website at www.justlawllc.com. And if you're not already following the Just Law Instagram page where we give just facts on everything from trademarks to a will to a trust, follow it um, um, because it breaks down from sort of the high overview, but it breaks down real helpful tidbits that um, can easily answer some questions in the event that you don't have time to schedule for um, a consultation call. But yeah. I'm always accessible. I um, love to talk about this stuff as you pro all probably imagine on this call today. And so I'm happy, especially education for underserved and often overlooked people. So reach out, let's set up some time. There was a, a question in, um, in the Q&A about um, can we talk about uh, Juanel's chair and its power? Um, and I'm not sure. I didn't know if any of the panelists knew about this, but I don't know about this. Okay. All right. So I guess we can't talk about it very well tonight, <laughs> but hopefully soon. <laughs> um, and then this is kind of a nice question maybe to wrap up on, um, but where do we go from here to start building our generational wealth for our families and educating our children and maybe even for our communities? Well, for me, I feel like you made the first step by just coming tonight and really following the work of Nexus Community Partners. Um, Again, I would go back to what I said earlier, give yourself some grace um, re and reach out, right? I, all of us, I, I don't want to speak for the other panelists, but I'm assuming all of us here are willing to, you know, just share um, share ways that you can do it, whether it's things that we've learned or other avenues and really designing what wealth looks like um, for you that, you know, Nakuli um, sort of highlighted a little earlier. So I would just say, don't be hesitant to reach out. Um, but I mean, there, I, I think once, once you have the information then you start to realize that it's actually 
not at, it's like the gatekeeping that uh, that the society does to prevent us from getting this information is because to Nikuli's point earlier they know how powerful we will be if we had this information so once you have it I would just put it on you to teach the next person that doesn't have this information so that they all they too can start to build wealth you know and I would I would add to that not that I'm trying to give Nexus uh more work but we do need uh, hubs where community people can come together. And, uh, you know, it's it's good for us to access this knowledge individually, but our most powerful, powerful tools have been when we've come together in some kind of collective formation to discuss, uh, to engage in principal struggles. Not all of us are gonna agree on a particular path. And, you know, in the many years I've lived here, it seems that there are fewer and fewer of those options where people could come around in terms of, uh, you know, once upon a time there were uh, bookstores. Uh, there were, I'm not sure how much freedom schools are in their uh, initial form. They've transformed so much, but we desperately need community spaces. Uh, one of the uh, issues for today is that people try to do this stuff alone and it's very difficult uh, to build the kind of freedom dreams that we're talking about. Uh, but, and the other piece of this, and I know because this has been my model of struggle, that when you're in conversation with other people, uh, the power of that is exponentially greater than anything we think we know as an individual. It builds dramatically. So, you know, I don't know where this can happen. Uh, one of the better things that happen uh, once upon a time is that uh, from the university, uh, we used to do uh, the community-based uh, courses. Uh, they they cried poor and, and folk who were able to take those courses and ultimately get credentialed uh, at very low cost. And one of the commitments I have before riding off in the sunset is trying to re-establish uh, that. And I've had a couple of conversations about uh, how that could be done. It, it was a tremendous resource for our community and for people uh, back to uh, to Anisha's point who are quote under, underserved. So uh, building collective is my recommendation, so. Yeah, I think a lot of beautiful things have been said. I think figuring out where in community, other spaces you wanna continue to build that figuring out who's doing the work and really collaborating or connecting with them. I think there's a lot of power in relationship building um, and figuring out like who is an ally in this work, who is down for the cause, who's ready to fight with you in the cause and who's maybe ready to just kick back and have uh, have that space to give yourself some grace together as you're talking through this as well. Um, but yeah, this work is gonna take time. I think it was mentioned before that we didn't create this. It's uh, years and years and years of going back and um, undoing a lot of the hurt and harm that has been put together, put put in place. And what does it look like to let reimagine that? And I think it's through community, through ourselves. It involves all of our elders and involves all of the young babies um, coming together to figure out figure out like what something different looks like. Um, so that's how we build wealth and community together. <laughs> Um, I wanted to, um, just read quickly, um, from a participant that said, um, panelists, you all have been a rich reservoir of wisdom, resources, encouragement, encouragement, and inspiration. I appreciate all that you have done to educate yourselves and to share that with others. And so in service, you are truly a part of our beloved community. Um, and I think that they summed that up um, just perfectly. And so thank you so much uh, for sharing all of your work and insights and time and energy with us all tonight. I think we've all probably learned something new and been encouraged to come together um, and continuing to come together and, um, and to continue to build wealth together. Um, so we appreciate all of your time. As we've said um, in the beginning that we will be following up 
um, with an email with all of the resources that um, have been lifted up and there will be another Black Wealth Community Education session that is in April. And the focus of that is health and well-being. Is that education. right? Education. Education in April and health and well-being in May. Um, and so we'll send more updates. We also have that survey for you. If you haven't um, filled that out, we would really appreciate hearing your feedback to learn um, what you thought worked well for um, this education session and what could be improved. Um, and I hope everyone can take good care and we will send the link and all the other information.